Hi, Ninja Nerds. In this video today, we're going to be talking about urinary tract infections. So if you do like this video, please give it a thumbs up, comment down below, don't forget to subscribe, and check out NinjaNerd.org. That's where all of our illustrations and notes are for all the lectures we put up here are available for you guys. So let's get started here with UTIs. We're going to talk about the pathophysiology, and when we're talking about UTIs, we're focusing on the urinary tract. So we're looking at the kidneys, the ureters, bladder, and then our urethra, right? And what we're talking about here is, what is the normal flow of a urinary tract? What are we looking at? We're looking at our kidneys that are producing filtrate, filtrate that exits, goes down and through our bladder, and then through urethra out our body, okay? And when we get an infection, we can have many different types of viruses, fungi, or bacteria that can either accumulate, cause, travel up into our kidneys, and then cause various types of infections or inflammation within those. So we can think of a pyelonephritis, we can think of cystitis, and when we do have these different types of infections, there's one common causative agent or something that is going to make a UTI within our body or make us have an infection, and that's E. coli. And if we think about the normal anatomy of a urinary tract and how it all filters down through, there is a nice little valve here, our urovesicle valve, that is allowing urine to go into the bladder and not backflow back into our ureter, right? And then flow urine out our urethra. It's all going in this downward passage, right? In and out our body. So when we have some type of issue of a backflow, we have some type of blockage, we have an obstruction, we have some type of anomaly or abnormality within our structure, we can get issues that are going to cause a UTI. So what happens? Urine flows out. So if we get E. coli that essentially comes from nearby, particularly the rectum, it starts to ascend and it can ascend up into the bladder. Once it gets into the bladder, we maybe have a distension of the bladder, we're holding our urine too long, maybe there's a blockage down here from our prostate that's not letting us be able to pass urine. So our bladder starts to distend and overflow. It's causing pressure on this valve. And then we get backflow up into the kidney, right? That can cause all types of issues within our urinary tract. So remember, urine is sterile and we want it to be flowing down, right, out through the urinary tract. So keeping in mind that urine is sterile, that this urine is gonna flow down through, we can have a lot of those causes or risk factors that can potentially make us more at risk for a UTI. First one is being female. Okay, one of the big issues for this is the shorter urethra and also the proximity of the rectum to the, the opening, the urethra, is going to cause an issue for E. coli to potentially be able to accumulate and then grow or go up into our bladder. So that's the first cause. The second cause could be different types of medications, particularly thinking about antibiotics that can break down our good flora or our good bacteria that we have within this area and then allow the bad bacteria to grow up into our urinary tract. Other things that we can think about are people that are on some type of immunosuppressant or they are immunosuppressed by having some type of issue going on or even diabetes can also cause an issue because we're gonna have a lot of sugar within that urine and what does bacteria like to eat? We like to eat, have that area for things to grow and then we can have bacteria shooting up back into that urinary tract. Another thing is also having a urinary catheter. A urinary catheter Right, it's gonna sit in our bladder here and it's gonna come out through urethra and exit our body. That's a nice little tunnel, nice little highway for any type of bacteria to climb up right into the bladder, right? It's gonna even bypass the urethra right into that bladder and be able to cause some type of infection. So we wanna make sure that when we do have patients that have urinary catheters, we are cleaning those catheters. Next one, we talked about a little bit before, any type of obstruction blockage, right? We have kidney stones, we have an enlarged prostate that is compressing any type of issues with the valve where we're having issues of keeping uh, urine within the bladder and not going back flowing up. Anything like that can also cause us to be at risk for UTI. And then the last we can talk about is hygiene. So some of the things that we want to talk about with patients that could be at risk for UTIs are using any type of perfume or soap any type of issues with hygiene where we're not cleaning as often as we should be, we are not cleaning properly, where for especially women, 
we're wiping back to front, which we're just taking any type of bacteria that is in the back, right, around the rectum, and as we wipe, we're pulling it closer to the urethra. So any type of hygiene issue could also be causing a savvy UTI. So when we look at this list here, we're, we're looking at all these different types of risk factors that can give us a UTI. And when we think about a UTI and we think about a patient that has a UTI, some of those symptoms are very, very slight or very uh, low. Maybe they, they notice it once and they're like, mm, I don't know, something was off. Or it could manifest into a patient being full on septic. So let's talk about those signs and symptoms. Now, when we have a patient that has a UTI or comes in and we start to suspect that there may be a UTI, there is a grouping of signs and symptoms that we may point us into that direction of thinking there might be something going on with this patient. So the first thing is going to be that burning, right, that pain when they go to the bathroom, so that dysuria. And they might also complain of not only having pain, but they feel like they're going to the bathroom often or they're also going, but like nothing's not really coming out. So they're either having some urgency or they're having frequency. And then they might also complain of when they do go to the bathroom, the urine's either looking kind of dark, maybe it's stinky, it's like, oh, yeah, this, it's got a really strong odor. It's stinky or smelly urine. They might then also start to complain of some back pain. And then they might also say, I don't know, I've been spiking a fever at home, or I just feel really hot, kind of sweaty. And when we talk about this back pain, they may also be able to assess this, right, for our patient. So we're going to ask them, where is that back pain? And they might point to their lower back, kind of like the flank area, a little bit higher. Okay, and they're gonna say, I don't know, it's just like in my lower back in the middle here. And you can check for costal vertebral um, tenderness. So when we're doing this is that we're gonna be looking at the CVA right here. We're looking at this 12th rib, okay? You're gonna put this hand nice and flat. You're gonna palpate on one side, put this hand on their back, palpate on this side, ask them if that's tender, okay? And what we're looking at here is, is there tenderness within our, our back here, right here at our CVA, our costal vertebral angle, that is indicating to us that there may be something going on with the kidneys. Patient may also be complaining of some nausea and vomiting. And this patient, if they're in the older category, right, they're maybe a geriatric patient, they may pre present with us as to com some confusion or new onset incontinence, meaning they are now not able to make it to the bathroom before they you know, urinate. So to those two slews together could also be how a UTI is depicted within the geriatric population, although any patient of any age or gender can have any of these symptoms. So once we have a patient that we think has a UTI or we're suspecting a UTI, we can get some diagnostics done. And we can do a bunch of blood work, right? Make sure that's okay. But the big thing that's gonna tell us that this patient has a UTI is a urinalysis. So what we want is we want a clean catch, midstream urinalysis. We wanna make sure the patient has cleaned themselves with the wipe before we get this urine because we wanna make sure that we're getting the best sample so that we can test it correctly. So we instruct our patient, make sure they wipe, pee a little bit, get that urine, put the cap on, don't touch the inside of the lid, don't touch the inside of the container, and then bring it to us. And we send it down to the lab. We send it down to the lab and then it may show us that there's blood within the urine. They may show us that there's white blood cells within the urine. They may also show that there is some bacteria, right? And then we can send it off for a urine culture. We see that there's blood, white blood cells, bacteria within the urine, we send it off for a urine culture. What is urine culture? So I'm gonna take the urine, we put it with an agar in a petri dish, we let it grow for a couple days. It's gonna be able to show us what type of bacteria or fungus or anything else that is growing within that urine so that we can identify the type and what it is. It's gonna be able to tell us what type of antibiotic this patient might need to go on. It's also gonna be able to tell us where that UTI is, is possibly within the body. Because remember, within the urinary tract, we have our kidneys, our ureters, our bladder, and our urethra. So a UTI is involving any or all of those, right? So we wanna make sure that we know with this, we're able to treat that correctly. We can also do an ultrasound or a CT that's gonna be able to tell us, like we talked about before, any types of abnormalities, obstructions, the stone, uh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia or anything else that could be causing issues within the urinary tract to retain and or cause an infection. Once we've identified this patient has a UTI, then we can talk about treatment. Now for treatment, when we have a patient that has a UTI, we can treat them 
very specifically to what type of causative agent or bacteria that they have going on within this UTI. But typically, there's antibiotics that we give. There's those havonides or the sulfa drugs that we give them. So as long as they're not allergic to the sulfa drugs, um, if they ever had it before, you can also teach the patient a little bit about any type of allergic reaction, swelling within the lips, the tongue, right, hives, itchiness, swelling within the throat. You know, we want to make sure that we tell them about those reactions so that they can get help. Okay, and we also want to make sure that they know that they should avoid sun exposure because the sulfur drugs are usually the area where people are allergic to those antibiotics. There's also the fluoroquinolones that we can give them as well. Biggest thing to remember for that for the NCLEX is that Achilles rupture, so they need to report any new muscle pain to their doctor so that we can maybe take them off that antibiotic. And there's many other antibiotics that we can give the patients, but these are the two most common ones that we're going to be giving for UTIs. Then we can also give the patients some analgesics. One of the most common ones that we give them is the phenazopyridine, also known as pyridium. This is the medication that turns the urine orange. So if you have a patient that's never taken this before, you wanna make sure that they know that it's gonna turn their urine orange uh, and let them um, be able to assess and be aware of that. And it should be orange and orange for a couple days, but then it should go away. And they wanna make sure that they're able to know that in case one, it scares them, and two, they can notify their PCP if there's any change within their urine. And then we can go into their education. Now, if this patient has a substantial infection where they maybe also have to take some other medications, giving them Tylenol to treat their fever, giving them Zofran to treat their nausea, right? We can also do that. But the education is the most important thing is to finish the round of antibiotics, particularly the medications that are prescribed to them. So they're gonna be taking those medications, say we put them on a sulfa drug, they went home, they started taking it, and then their urine culture came back, showed us that it was a different type of bacteria, we wanted to switch it to a fluoroquinolone. We can, right? We wanna make sure we call the patient, tell them stop taking the sulfa, let's take the fluoroquinolone, this'll treat that better, because we wanna make sure that we're treating the infection that they have. Not every UTI is the same for every patient. So we wanna make sure they take the medication as prescribed, and then we also wanna promote fluids. So when a patient is experiencing UTI, we want them to intake around three liters, depending on what their issue is, three liters of fluid a day. And we can also encourage cranberry juice. The only reason, or one of the reasons, but one of the only ones that the NCLEX usually hit on is they cannot take the cranberry juice if they have cystitis or uh, irritation within the bladder because the cranberry juice can actually make more of an irritation. So we wanna promote fluids around three liters per day, water, cranberry juice, in order to help flush bacteria out. Because remember, urine's sterile. We also wanna be able to push that bacteria out. We're gonna be taking the antibiotics to treat the infection, but we wanna make sure that it's not ascending any higher. So as we flush that urinary tract, it's gonna push the rest of the bacteria and keep it where it's at, where it's out the body. Promoting good hygiene. Remember we talked about this before. Patients that are making sure they're wiping correctly, right? We're wiping front to back. We are taking showers daily, okay? We're not taking baths. Wet swimsuits, if we're sitting in those over the summer, right? It's gonna create a nice little moist area. Bacteria be able to grow and ascend right into our urethra. So we wanna make sure perfumes, any type of menstrual products, tampons, pads, all of those are creating good hygiene that we're keeping everything clean down there. We also want to encourage our patient to be able to urinate around every three to four hours. Even if they don't have the urge to go to the bathroom, we should have them still be able to go to the bathroom and try to void. That is to just make sure that we're emptying that bladder. There's no retention in the bladder. The bladder's not over distended. It's not causing an issue with that valve to have too much pressure where we're having urine go up into our ureters. We also want to make sure that we're voiding after intercourse. And then a couple things to avoid are alcohol or coffee, right? These are gonna create these diuretic effects, right? And we wanna make sure that we're avoiding this with our patients so we're able to create a nice urinary tract that is going to be able to go back to normal, get rid of this infection, and hopefully not have a reoccurrence. So I hope this video made sense, Ninja Nerds. Hope you learned something. Good luck on your next exam. And as always, until next time.